Hey everybody, this is Robbie with Robbie's Reptiles. Today we're going to be doing a bit of a Q&A, but treat it as a podcast. It's going to be a little bit longer form. Some of the questions that I put up on a Q&A last night, you're going to jump? Last night I was filming another podcast, and then I put up onto my story some Q&A questions and things like that. I ended up not getting the chance uh, to get to those in that episode of the podcast. So technically this is going to be episode four. The next one will be episode five, but in the next one I say... Welcome to episode four, et cetera, et cetera. But you guys can go ahead and just treat this like another podcast. I'm going to just title it a Q&A, though, because that seems to get more views than any podcast-related things. First question is, as a newbie, how many geckos should you start with? Um, that entirely depends on too many factors for me to simply just give you a simple answer. Um, you know, first you got to consider, are you trying to do this as a hobby? Maybe, you know, five or less. Are you trying to do this as a full-time business, and are you quitting your job in the near future in order to pursue breeding crested geckos? You might need to, you know, get more like 20, 25, as much as your budget can handle. But you don't want to be getting anything that's, that I, anyone would consider low quality. Um, some people have preferences, of course, but look at the market. Look at what people are buying. Uh, like right now, if I were you, I wouldn't invest in a cappuccino. I'm going to say... Everyone should probably wait until the economy comes back up or until there's more uh, outcrosses being done to really cool things. Um, I know like for me specifically, while cappuccino market has definitely dropped a lot, this is my full-time job, so I have to adjust for that, take that loss. But there's definitely steps that you can take in order to ensure uh, success in the long run which is doing unique outcrosses or focusing on more minute things such as soft scale, super soft, as well as head structure. Body structure is also a thing. I need to go over this in a video, but there is something to consider when buying a breeding gecko. Um, it, I believe the Rachidactylus book refers to it as jelly bone. I don't know why it happens specifically, um, but sometimes I've gotten females from you know, random breeders that I talked to or, or bought from on Morph Market, and the female comes in very hollow feeling and that's pretty much the best way that I can describe it and so now I've just gotten to the point where I can look at a photo of a gecko and I can tell you if it'll feel hollow or if it'll feel dense moonshine right here is extremely dense she's not hollow at all uh, things that could lead to a gecko being hollow would maybe be um, improper nutrition during pregnancy or improper nutrition maybe growing all the way up so if your nutrition is on point then you'll most likely not have anything that's jelly bone. Anything that I've produced and grown up or had in my care um, from like juvenile to adulthood, I've never experienced any sort of jelly bone. Uh, if you guys want to know what sort of like nutri what I do for my gecko nutrition and everything like that, I would go and watch the videos that I have about gecko nutrition, stuff like, you know, grass fed goat whey and organic uh, honey and feeding your insects that you feed to your geckos, organic things, and things like that. I had a lot of people that were actually laughing at me for saying that I give my Red Runners exclusively organic stuff, or at least as much as, I, uh, as, much as I'm able to, only giving them organic materials, um, oranges, apples, potatoes, that transfers over into the gecko's nutrition, thus creating healthier, hardier geckos. And now, and so I was saying a lot of people, you know, were laughing at me, saying, oh, that's pointless, blah, blah, blah. Well, now look, now if you go on eBay and you try to buy crickets, you go anywhere. Now all of the bug companies are starting to switch over to saying organic. You can do a little bit of a price hike, or these days you can just at least stay the same. But anyway, so as a newbie, how many geckos should you get? Um, what are you trying to be? If you're trying to be just a hobbyist, honestly, I would suggest getting one male and four females. Uh, I think that would be a really great start. That just, that'd be a strong start because in theory, if there are some really good females— um, and another question is really good that I want to get to, um, and it has to do with if you only, if you had a specific budget, what would you invest it in? But if you're going to be getting into it as a hobby, I mean, having one male and four females, if they're stellar, like good females, and you don't even have to spend money. Like I have some females that I got for 300 bucks that are some of my best females. They outproduce themselves every year. If you pair them correctly, they will create babies that people will be in love with. Uh, you just have to know what to pair with and just observe, you know, what you've noticed trending in, in the hobby and seeing other people's results too and then comparing it to your stock. So anyway, if you have one male, four females, that'd be a great start. In theory, you'd be making 40 babies a year. That's not a bad start. But, you know, sometimes a female only lays you six eggs. Some you know, Most of the time, though, a female, 
uh, will give you anywhere from 8 to 12 total eggs a year. I'd say your first year, that would be a good start. If you can afford to get really nice ones, like a good lily white uh, male, and then a bunch of really nice, like, drippy or extreme harlequin, even triple X females, you know, I mean, of course, that would end up being like a $10,000 endeavor for only five geckos. You will make back all of that every single season. So I think that'd be a great start if you were just starting out. And then t test the water. That'd be not bad. And you, of course, don't have to get that high of quality. You could also do it with a total of a $1,000 budget. You can get, you know, the most expensive male you can possibly think of, and then maybe get like a 10 lot from AC Reptiles to grow them up. And then hopefully a lot of them are female and then just keep those. Um, that's a much longer endeavor though, but you'd be able to get more bang for your buck. So it's too, too nuanced of a question. You know what I mean? How do you start a project? I want to get into it, but I don't know where to start. So coming up with a project is just like, what have you not seen and what do you want to do now? So like me, I have decided that I want to like really hone in on extreme harlequins, specifically triple X, that line of extreme harlequin without pinstripe. That's a line. And I want to hone in on that because I think it's the most impressive looking phenotype in the, in the entire hobby. Now opens up the floodgates. Well, there's no triple X lily whites. There's no, tr there's not really any triple X cappuccinos, let alone triple X exanthics or triple X sables or you know, you know what I mean? So now that's a project of me just having a goal in mind, and now I need to take a couple of years, acquire certain geckos to accomplish that goal. Um, so a project can be kind of whatever you want. You know, some people are doing a patterned Dalmatian project. While I think they're wrong, that is by definition a project because that's a goal that you've set. You are now taking the steps necessary to accomplish that goal. I mean, that's really all that it is. So just come up with something. Like, I, I got a cold fusion mail at the show. I was like, now that I'm focusing on triple X's, I'm going to make cold fusion triple X's. That'd be dope. That's it. I don't know what else to tell you. Is that, did any of that make sense? This is the really good question. If you had $3,000 to invest into Crested Geckos plus equipment, how would you go about it? I'm assuming that he means... $3,000 not including equipment. If it was $3,000 plus equipment, though, you could still get by. It'd be the same thing. I would say buy the highest end male that you can and then buy a bunch of six or seven out of 10 females, as much as you can that will max out your budget because a male is worth his weight in gold. But the problem is that only the nine out of 10 males are worth a lot. Anything that's like a seven out of 10 and lower ends up being practically worthless in the market. Of course, every animal is so valuable. We all love them as a pet, as a hobby. It's great. And obviously every animal has the same value in that they're a living creature. There should be blah, blah, blah. Okay. So nobody go and start writing crap on Facebook and stuff. I'm just, I'm talking business specifically. That's why you see so many males always on big sales. Oh, big Black Friday sale. And it's 90 males and 15 females. Um, because we can't use males, really. Once we already have, you know, a big daddy papa male that is amazing, he's proven, really great example of whatever he's doing. Let's say he's a 9.5 out of 10 gecko. We'll use Giga Chat as an example. Unless he outproduces himself, there's no reason to keep any other male. Unless, of course, you're to the point where you really need just mass genetic diversity. Now, there is something interesting that I have experienced this year, and I heard someone speak about it on a podcast. I believe it was on Zero's Gecko's podcast. And AJ was talking about how, and I've run into this problem. So this year, I had a lot of people that would hit me up, say, hey, I want to get this gecko. I'd be like, cool. And they'd be like, do you have anything else available? And everything else that I had available was from that same dad. So they would have all been half siblings. Whatever your preferences are, a lot of people's preferences, they don't want anything that's half-sibling or anything like that. At, m at least they would want like a cousin or something. And so I ran into that problem because Giga Chad was just knocking it out of the park, pairing left and right, doing a bunch of cool stuff, and he has outperformed what I ever expected. He's made some amazing babies. The problem being I have so many from Giga Chad now. And I am going to be replacing him. That is why I have him up for sale right now. Because I have not only babies that he's made that outperform him, but I also had one that I hatched out for free and by accident, sort of, as a mistake, that 
is the best lily I've ever seen. So that, and it does have pores, so I'm keeping it, and it will more than likely replace him full time. So this year I'm not focusing so much on making any lilies because I've noticed that the market trend has definitely gone away from lily. Everyone's trying to focus on other things. But anyway, so it might be a good idea to maybe have two males, but if you're working with just $3,000, um, one male, the most expensive male that you can you can figure, that you can muster, in order to work with as many females as possible to pair him to. I would suggest getting a male that has a lot of pattern because you can either be a, you know, you can either be a million dollar gecko breeder or you can be someone that's looking for a, a nice looking pet in the $200 range. If you have a really nice extreme Harlequin that doesn't have any Dalmatian spots, um, and you're pairing that male to things like, it could even be, you know, mid-range lily whites. It could even be just a pinstripe female. The babies are either going to make you um, lilies, really nice lilies, or they'll make you some decent-looking pinstripe harlequins. You might even get a couple that don't have pinstripe and get some really cool triple Xing or really nice just coverage. So just like for for anyone's, for my general recommendation to anyone trying to get in is Extreme Harlequin is going to be timeless. That lateral pattern that you see on this gecko right here is always going to be something that people want. And as long as, and you don't even need contrast really because there's some other projects that you could have in mind, but lots of pattern, lots of contrast, and try to have a good looking head structure. Uh, big, wide, uh, as big as you can get. That's going to set you up for success. Um, so yeah, I would suggest one male about an, uh, either, you know, a lily or a really nice extreme harlequin and then get as many females as you can look around on morph market. I even have had some good success from going on to morph market sorted from least to most in, in price and you can go and filter to only female. And I've found a couple of females that are really nice. Um, not by like, you know, this standard, but I mean, they're six and a half out of 10. But if I pair them with one of my 10 out of 10 males, all of the babies are going to be eight out of 10s. And I know it from experience. Um, today, I just hatched out an incredible, awesome, extreme Harlequin, uh, really awesome looking lily white baby fresh out of the egg. It's the best lily that I've ever hatched. And it's from a $300, maybe even a $250 female paired to Giga Chad. And it's an orange female at that with barely any horizontal patterning, but it did have a little bit of white horizontal patterning. So I knew if I pair this white patterned orange to Giga Chad, I heard that pairing C2s or oranges and yellows to black makes either really bright yellows or really dark blacks. So I tested it. Um, but because I knew it had some of that white pattern, it would complement the lily really well in any of their visual offspring. And they've made four visual lily whites, each one proving my theory that the white pattern from the mom would complement beautifully with the lily making, you know, $1,500 babies out of the egg from a $300 female that I literally have labeled as random orange female because it was like, oh wow, that one's like too cheap to pass up. I'll buy that. I haven't come up with a name for her. Um, for only $300 and she was 30 grams when I got her. Now she's like 45, uh, a great producer too. She's staying here forever. And so that, you know, kind of shows you don't have to be buying the best stuff. I mean, yeah, a couple of my geckos here are three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000. Um, and I've paid three or four or $5,000 for those geckos. And sometimes they don't make you that good of geckos. And then other geckos I have uh, that I bought for, $500 that have made some of my best stuff ever. Um, but yeah, I would recommend for the $3,000 budget, first, you're going to obviously need enclosures and stuff. And honestly, you can probably take some time before you needed to buy baby hatchling tubs and everything like that, because you're going to have to wait, you know, four months before you even hatch out any. Uh, if you buy them all, receive them all, let them chill for a month or two, pair them, then they lay eggs, then you wait the three months for the eggs to hatch. You don't need to buy all the hatchling stuff immediately. You can probably, if you're very frugal and you're needing to be frugal, you can do it that way and be fine. And gecko food is incredibly inexpensive and it's so, it's so easy to get and it's so easy to care for. So that's not even something that I would consider. You could probably feed five crested geckos 
for a year off of fifty dollars worth of food. Uh, this is a funny question. How do you reach the tubs that are all the way at the top? Um, well, we do have a three. Is it here? No. We do have a three tier stepping ladder, um, but believe it or not, I don't even use the uh, the tubs that are at the top. They're almost purely there for just the looks. Even all of these enclosures that are behind me, for now, are empty. Um, I have about 300 babies, and I'm growing up, though, that will be filling all of these up within the next six months. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Why don't you breed gargoyle geckos? I just think they're ugly. I see these really fancy ones, and they don't impress me at all. I'm like, cool, it's got a red stripe on its back. Where's the pattern? Where's the head structure? Where's the, the uniqueness, the gravitas to the pattern? I don't even know if that word worked there, but it sounded really cool in the moment, didn't it? Uh, what racks are those? These racks I've gotten from Lone Star Racks here in Houston, not here in Houston, here in Texas. They're in Houston, Texas, so it's about a three and a half hour drive for me, sadly. Um, worth their weight in gold, amazing product. They make it very well every time. Uh, I make them specifically for the six quart tubs and they have an option to have heat tape in the back. I don't to save costs because my whole building is heated and humidified. Name suggestions for a female blue tongue skink. Lahero. Do you think lily whites are becoming more and more neurologically problematic? No, I wouldn't say that at all. Um, Apparently, from what I've heard, the reason that that happened in the first place, it has been found or it has been found to be simply an incubation error. If it gets too hot during a lily white's incubation, it gets a head problem. I've probably made 30 lily whites this year, and I haven't had a single one with any head wobble or anything like that. And even my building is kind of kept at like, I don't incubate my eggs. I just leave them in the room. Um, so sometimes it gets up to 85 or 82 degrees in here, and then other days it's down to like 69. Um, no problems at all. So I wouldn't say this becoming problematic. I think this is a later question. I had someone else ask me this, and I saw a post about it. Granted, I don't know. I don't have my own experience from it, I guess. But in theory and genetically, mathematically, one might even say, People are asking, is it okay to pair a non-lily white from a lily white parent, right? So you have two geckos that met and fell deeply in love. They loved each other very much. They paired, had a baby, or had two babies. One was a lily and one was not a lily, okay? Then you get that non-lily, you sell it to someone, and then they want to pair that to a lily white down the road. Is that okay? I'm not sure how it wouldn't be because mathematically it can't have the lily white gene. It does not have the lily white gene. The way that incomplete and codominance works is 50% of the offspring either get it or they don't. There's no carrying. There's nothing like that. The reason they're bringing this up is because recently there's been people that have been pairing a non-lily white to uh, a lily white, or even a non-lily to a non-lily, and by non-lily, I mean the sibling of a lily white in this example, and then getting a leucistic. Rather than just saying that, oh, you can't pair non-lily lineage to lilies now, I think it more so has to do with some sort of recessive thing that is just leading to fatal offspring. Or it might be something that went wrong in the incubation that just made it not produce that which I guess you could say is a genetic thing, um, but it has led to fatality. So it probably is something recessive that has been passed down generation to generation by accident. And of course you can't know because it's recessive. I don't think that there's anything wrong with doing it, nor do I have like an ethical qual qualm with it, um, but I have not tested this. I will go ahead and also test out this this season and see what happens. But to my knowledge, that shouldn't be a problem in any way. If soft scales are incomplete dominant, would that mean that two softs have a 50% chance to produce supers? Um, well, let's go ahead and do a pun and square here. I may or may not put up a graphic. I might be too lazy. Well, if one is capital S and then little s, and the other one is capital S, little s, then that means that you have a 25% chance of making a super soft, and you have a 50% chance of making a soft with a 25% chance of making a normal. Uh, so no, 25% chance. 
And um, someone else I saw asked a question uh, about like what possible soft scale means. Due to soft scale being a pretty nuanced thing other than um, really great cases of it showing, just like there's quality with expression and pattern, there's also quality in the size and distance of the scales creating that different look and color. Um, some babies I've hatched out that are from a soft scale to a normal, and as soon as they hatch, I'm like, that's a soft scale. Like, they have a look. Um, you kind of have to learn it, though. So to be safe, though, most of the time, if I pair a soft scale to a normal, I will just always lift the, list the offspring as a possible soft scale because I don't want to be like, I'll probably disclose, I'm pretty sure it's a soft scale, but I can't say for sure. Um, otherwise, I don't want to sell, and nor do other breeders that are working with soft and supers, they don't want to list the gecko as a soft scale, then only for you to grow it up, and then through macro photography or through breeding, you don't make supers, nor does it pass on a soft scale gene, then they don't want to, we don't want to go through that kind of issue down the road. So we say possible, because even if, but most more than likely, we'll be like, it's a possible soft scale, I'm like 90% sure though this is a soft scale. Like I've bought super softs from AC and he's like, the only reason that I call them a super soft is, or I call them a possible super is because they aren't from a super soft to a super soft pairing. So I don't, he just doesn't want to deal with the possibility of it not being, and then that being a big issue and dramatic and just being like, you know, a hassle. So he just says it's possible. But then he will, he always note, noted on the tub, I'm 99% sure that this is a super. Like this is probably a super soft. Um, so I'm just pairing and breeding them to prove it out. Why are droopy crests preferred? Um, it's just a human preference thing. And of course, uh, there was some guy that got super angry at me in the comments because I like that. Um, yeah, that was an interesting, <laughs> interesting read. But uh, wide head, I would say, is more so the preference. We want big heads. Like Cowboy looks so awesome because his head structure is just incredible. It makes them look, you know, bigger, heftier. It's like a dude having wide shoulders. It's just like, does it help with survival? Does it help with anything? No, not really. Does it increase your chances of reproduction? No, if anything, it probably worsens it for the crested geckos. Um, we just like it. Um, I know some people also prefer like shorter snout. I haven't really delved into that, nor do I care to. Um, like Moonshine here, I would consider has good head structure. It's not great, though. It could definitely be improved, mainly for the fact that it goes slightly up, but she has really awesome spikes or crests. Um, you know, it gets pretty nuanced, but, you know, when you just see a really wide head that droops down and almost touches the ground, I mean, it's just, it's so big that it's drooping down. That's pretty much all that that means. Um, but by no means should that be, like, a standard. How do you identify soft and super soft? Because people call them possible softs. Yeah, that was the question. You identify a soft scale um, by either getting one from AC who's extremely experienced and then you'll be able to see it in person and tell. But mainly I've been told you can do macro shots or you can use a gecko loop on... Why are you crawling around so much, honey? You can do some... Uh, you can use a loop and look at the scales on the head of the gecko. And if the scales are very small and distant apart, then it's most likely soft scale. Um, they also are more vibrant usually, or they just have a different look to them. AC Reptiles, though, I was talking to him, and he was saying that he can actually just feel the belly and be able to identify soft, super, non-soft, anything like that. So I've been kind of comparing all of my gecko's bellies to figure it out. Um, but if you have to be like, is this a soft scale? It probably isn't. But if you're like, is this a super soft? Then it probably is. That's kind of my own rule. Uh, and then they said, I thought it was just zoom into the scales, but do you actually have to prove it out? I would suggest always trying to prove out anything that you're claiming you have. Um, but yeah, so you should know it. if you had a super, then you breed it to something and then all of the babies will be soft scale. How long do you think it'll take for caps to drop in price? They're already dropping hectic scales. They're at like $1,500. But the problem, you know, the same thing with lilies. Lilies, I saw a lily go up the other day for $175. It's just quality. That's, that's it. I know that my caps that I make, sure as hell, are not going to be $1,500, $2,500. They're, they're going to be five dollars or $7,000 because they're going to be really nice. They're going to be from soft scale pairings or tangerine 
uh, fraps, or they're going to be head exanthic caps. They're going to be like stuff that no one has done before. Um, I'm not just trying to pair a cap to anything else that I get or go buy a bunch of females from Petco to just make them. Um, you know, focusing on head structure, focusing on nuanced things like soft scale, trying to pair to reds to make reds and oranges and things like that. This, I don't know, there's the cappuccino thing is a crazy, crazy thing called love. When you outcross a gene like cold fusion, how much does the gene regress in percentages? In percentages, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I can't speak on it. I do not know. Uh, I'm doing my first outcrosses this year. The female that I have just laid eggs from Sigma Chad, which is going to be great. So we'll see how that turns out. Do you think the gecko market will go up or down in 2023? Um, in terms of the economy, it's going to go way down. A lot of people are already getting out, abandoning ship, if you will, which is great for me and great for people that have invested their whole lives into it. You know, whenever there's economic downturn, that's opportunity for people that waited out or have been planning on that economic downturn. And whatever your political beliefs are, especially with this one being as planned as it was, um, a lot of people that are at the top are going to be winning, and then a lot of people that were at the bottom are going to lose really hard, and it's really sad. But if you are in a position where you can capitalize on a lot of people just trying to um, abandon ship, sell everything at any cost, you know, that's a great opportunity for people like us that are breeding for the rest of our lives. So, um, I don't know. It depends. I've heard of a lot of ball python breeders debating selling a lot of their collection and then taking on or getting into crested geckos. So I think that is going to immensely uh, bring the demand of crested geckos up. If ball python breeders are trying to get into this as an investment, that also just shows other people that this species can be an investment and should be um, with how easy they are to take care of, which how interact with how fun and interactive they are to even be with. Like, look at this. I'm just chilling with this gecko. You couldn't do this with any other lizard. It's fantastic. I love being able to just hang out with them, put them on my shoulder while I clean their cage, take them out and show like my goddaughter or show other people's kids if they're here. They're just an awesome species. So I think once people, you know, with a lot of deep pockets see like, oh, this is an investment. I should sell some ball pythons or I should sell some retics or I should sell some whatever to get into this. Um, that might change the market next year, but I'm preparing for the worst so far. Um, not really mass panic selling at all. Uh, if anything, it's like, I'll just hold on to it until the market goes way up and then the demand and prices skyrocket again. Um, because luckily I have my film job that I still do primarily and that pays my bills. And then everything past that, is geckos. Um, yeah. Is that an answer? Why won't my mom let me get a snake? And also, how do you make a crested gecko cage bioactive? I don't know why your mom won't let you get a snake. A lot of people have a bad stigma towards reptiles, and I think that that needs to be changed. I think that needs to be um, up to people like me and other people that have a presence on social media and YouTube or just, you know, if you are a breeder and you have a small collection, expose it to as many people as you can and, you know, like, as soon as uh, my goddaughter started wanting to, like, see them, I really, like, you know, educated her on the fact that, like, these are animals, too, just like a cat or dog, just like a, you know, even just like a, a butterfly that you find outside. These are all animals that have a place in our ecosystem and in the world, and you should appreciate all animal life. Um, it's sad to see that so many people are like, a good snake is a dead snake, things like that. Um, depends. If you were trying to get like a 40 foot reticulated python though, like that's even a bit much for me. Could I handle it? Sure. Yeah, I could have one, but I don't want to. Um, I don't want to have anything and breed anything that isn't going to be, that isn't going to be a easy pet or a decent pet for me to sell to someone and feel no, uh, remorse or guilt for selling that person something um, without me being 100% confident that they can take care of it. And so that's why I work with crested geckos. And hopefully eventually shinglebacks. I mean, damn, they're so easy to take care of. It's crazy. Um, but I still, I, I'll be making a video. I will believe that. Um, 
how's Shingleback doing? She's doing great, Countryside Geckos. Um, she is getting big. She's got a nice plump tail. Uh, it's currently winter time, so she should be brumating, but she hasn't shown too much brumation activity. And um, she just had her first shed here, though, which was cool. Um, I haven't seen that in person. The shed looks really cool, though. So she's growing. She's doing well, honey. And it looks like that was all of the questions. I thought it was going to keep going and keep going, but luckily we're done. All right, guys. Moonshine's getting a bit restless here. Thank you guys for tuning in to today's video. Make sure to like, subscribe, all that YouTube mumbo jumbo. If you're looking for any crested geckos currently, make sure to check my website or my morph market, or just send me a DM. And please, guys, make sure to use code Robbie with Ship Your Reptiles. I don't make any money from it. I'm just trying to help you guys out. Like we were talking about, this economy is pretty rough. You can save $15 on one of your orders if you use code Robbie. So that will be it, and I'll see you guys in the next podcast that I filmed yesterday that will come out after this one.